Let's stand for the reading of the gospel. Now about eight days after saying these things, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, and he went up to the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his garments, his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Not knowing what he said. And as he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <coughs> Bokhar Tov, my name is John, and I am one of Jesus' disciples. But really, I'm no different than you. I'm a follower of Jesus, same as you are. And I've seen some miraculous things happen but many times they went right by me, zoom, 
I, I really didn't see Jesus' greatness and majesty and power and might any more than maybe you do in everyday life. Somehow, I was blind to what was there. But that one day, Transfiguration Day, it was different. And I hope that Transfiguration Day will be different for you too after this morning. Every time you come to worship from now on, maybe you'll see what I did, what was previously unseen. Let me tell you about that day. Well, Jesus took three of us, Peter, my brother James, and myself, and he went up to Mount Tabor to pray. It was a long and exhausting walk up to the summit of Mount Tabor, but when we got there, the effort was, was certainly worth it all. We could see the panorama of the whole countryside around, and we had a sense a sense of the big picture of life. We could imagine and, and feel all the history that had unfolded in this area for the people of God because of God. All the history that had taken place in this area, on this spot. Well, it was wonderful to be up there on the summit because we had a sense of being able to see more clearly more fully, more understandably. Maybe it was because we had been taken away from the busy valley below, down there where, where all of us had been really in the middle of the muddle. But here we were up here, and we could see much more clearly. It was plain, it was simple. You know, sometimes when you're right in the middle of the muddle, when you're caught in the confusions and contusions of life, you miss what's quite evident. Let me give you an example from your age today. Your preacher today told me this. A man was driving down a road, and he passed a traffic camera, and he saw it flash. Astounded that he had been caught speeding when he was just doing the speed limit, the man turned around and going even slower, he passed the camera again. It flashed once more and he couldn't believe it. So he turned around again and going a snail's pace, he passed the camera one more time and he saw it flash. And so he guessed there must be a problem with the camera, and he went home. Four weeks later, he received three traffic fines in the mail, all for not wearing a seatbelt. <laughs> see what he didn't see. Something quite evident. But this happens to us all the time, doesn't it? Let me give you an example from my age, 2,000 years ago. I, John, saw Jesus heal people and cast out demons and raise a dead girl and, and walk on water and still a violent storm. But I still didn't see that Jesus was the Messiah, the one and only Son of God. When that was revealed to us on Transfiguration Day, it caught the three of us disciples by surprise. We saw Jesus in a different way that day, and it surprised us. Have you ever taken Jesus for granted? Well, we had. He had become just another person, another friend, another human being who, who at times did amazing miracles, but who at other times was just like one of us, one of our friends, one of the boys. 
This particular day, Jesus took us to a place far above the cares and worries of this life. And he took us to a place where we would have a clear, crisp, clean view of life. And then he got us to pray. That praying made the difference. As he prayed and we prayed, we saw Jesus as he truly was, the mighty, the glorious Son of God. And we saw him with Moses dealing with God's law and with Elijah dealing with God's prophetic word. We didn't always want Jesus to do God's things like keeping the law, fulfilling the prophecies and the promises of God. Because he wanted to keep the law and, and, and fulfill all the prophecies of God, because he wanted to do the things of Moses and Elijah, he wanted to go to Jerusalem and he was going to suffer and die there and fulfill the law and bear it for us and die and then rise again. And we didn't know that at the time, but we didn't want that. We wanted Jesus to do our stuff, not God's stuff. God's laws were hard to keep and, and, and God's promises would take Jesus down a road of sacrifice and death that we didn't like. No, Jesus said Peter about three days before, you will never suffer and die when he gave us that idea that he was going to head to Jerusalem. No, no, said Peter, you will never do that. That's not part of our grand and glorious plan for you. You deserve much better than that. And Jesus looked at Peter straight in the eyes and said clearly, Satan, get behind me. Peter, you don't want me to suffer and die, so you're acting like Satan. You don't want to suffer and die for yourself, and you don't want me to suffer and die, but you don't understand the things of God, Peter. You're thinking only about the things of man. And so a few days after that, Jesus took Peter and James and me up on the mountaintop so he could show us clearly the things of God. When Jesus was up there on the mountaintop where the whole plan of life could be seen, Jesus spoke of his death and departure to Jerusalem and he glowed. He was there with Moses and Elijah and the plan to go to Jerusalem to die, and he glowed. Can you think of death and glow? A young 27-year-old unmarried woman who had cared for her sick mother for the past year sat at her mother's funeral. The hurt was so intense, she found it hard to breathe. What now, Lord, she asked as she sat alone in the hard pew, grieving. Her brother and sister had their families, but, but she had no one. Her place had been for the past year with, with her mother, preparing her meals, helping her walk, taking her to see the doctor, seeing after her medication, reading the Bible together, and now her mother was gone, and she was alone, and it's like her life was ended. Then she heard a door open and slam shut at the back of the church, and there were quick footsteps along the carpeted floor. An exasperated young man looked over briefly and then sat down next to her. His eyes were brimming with tears. 
and he began to sniffle. I, I'm late, he explained, although no explanation was necessary. And after several eulogies, he leaned over to her and asked, why do they keep calling Mary by the name of Margaret? Oh, the young woman replied, because that was her name, Margaret, never Mary. No one ever called her Mary, she whispered. And she wondered why this person who sat next to her couldn't have sat on the other side of the church. He was interrupting her, grieving with his tears and fidgeting. Who was this stranger anyhow? No, that isn't correct, he insisted, as several people glanced over at them and wondered what they were talking about at this solemn time. Her name is Mary, Mary Peters. That isn't who she is. Isn't this the Lutheran church, he asked sheepishly. No, she said. The Lutheran church is across the street. I think you're at the wrong funeral. And the solemnness of this occasion mixed with the realization of the man's mistake bubbled up inside the young woman and, and it came out <laughs> as laughter. And she cupped her hands to her face, hoping that maybe everyone around her would think she was just sobbing. But she was starting to laugh. The creaking pew gave her away. Sharp looks from the other mourners only made the situation seem more hilarious. She peeked at the bewildered, misguided man seated next to her, and he was laughing too as he glanced around, deciding it was far too late for a uneventful exit. She imagined her mother laughing at this. At the final amen of the service, they darted out a door and into the parking lot. I do believe we'll be the talk of the town, he smiled and said. He said his name was Rick, and since he had missed his aunt's funeral, he asked her out for a cup of coffee. Well, that afternoon began a lifelong journey. A year after their meeting, this couple would, was married at the church where he belonged. And this time, they both arrived at the right church at the right time. And this woman writes, in my time of sorrow, God gave me laughter. In place of loneliness, God gave me love. And this past June, we celebrated over 22 years of marriage together. Death can be the beginning of new life. Jesus knew that. And we who are Christians know that so, so clearly. Death is the beginning of new life. Jesus died and rose so that we can experience the end, but the beginning. We are buried with Christ by baptism into death, that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too will walk in newness of life. As a disciple, that happened in my life. What I, John, saw that day on Mount Tabor was the Son of God ready to live out the law and the gospel. He'd fulfill the law's demands, he would die, and he'd provide that all of God's promises became available to us. He would rise again so that we could rise. To see the commitment of Jesus on the mountaintop that day changed my life and commitment. When you see Jesus on the throne of life, then you can put him on the throne of your life too. And I hope that you'll be able to do as I have done. Only one person will get that place of honor in my life from now on. Only one person 
will be given leadership in my life. Only one person will determine what I say and what I do and how I will say it and do it. And that person is Jesus. When I come to worship, I will not fail to see him there. When I pray, I will not fail to see him right there beside me. And I, I hope you'll do the same. I hope you, like me, will see what was previously unseen. Let God show you his glory, his full glory, his true being, the Lord of life, the Lord of death, the Lord of new life. See him as I have seen him on that mountain. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds on Christ Jesus. Amen.